The oldest megalithic site ever discovered is that of Gobekli Tepe, located in southern Turkey, and this impressive site has forced scholars to change their models about the origin of human civilization. Based on the remains found, scholars have concluded that the area was used for some particular religious practice, but the really intriguing aspect of Gobekli Tepe is that no evidence of habitation has been found, and the area seems to only have been inhabited by hunter-gatherers. All previous models have presumed that humans took up agriculture before they devoted any time to building megalithic structures. And we also assumed that humans would first build living settlements and then develop religious buildings after they had settled. But Gobekli Tepe seems to indicate that the opposite is the case. Or as the lead investigator of the site, Klaus Schmidt, puts it, first came the temple, then the city. It seems that the belief in supernatural entities was involved in some way with humans transitioning from hunting and gathering in relatively small bands to a more sedentary lifestyle which progressively involved more and more people. If we compare humans with most other animals, one key difference is that humans are willing to believe in invisible, intangible gods which can't be directly observed. But what is it about these reverential entities that allows for such a significant change in human behavior? To answer this question, we will need to examine primate sociology at the most basic level. Before we begin, however, I will need to state that this video won't cover all of the psychological phenomena related to the concept of gods, and we will only be examining the psychology of gods at a primitive level. This means that the most common gods we will be looking at will have a masculine character, and feminine deities will be examined more closely in the future, as feminine gods seem to have a slightly different psychological origin than male or masculine deities. Humans are primates, and we are members of the family known as the Great Apes, which also includes chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Nearly all primate species are social, living in bands ranging from as few as six individuals to as many as 80, depending on the species. The social structure of these groups can be very complex, and not all species have the same structure. One of the most common ways in which groups organize themselves is according to dominance. The primatologist James J. McKenna defines dominance in the following way. Dominance refers to the relative status or social rank of an animal, as determined by its ability to compete successfully for goals with others. Such contested goals might include attempts to gain access to physical resources, such as preferred food items, or favorite sleeping or resting sites. Each animal in the group has a rank which reflects its dominance over the other members of the group. Between any two animals, one is subordinate and the other is dominant, and each member has his or her place in the hierarchy. In the vast majority of primates, males are dominant over females, although there are some exceptions, such as in bonobos and some species of lemurs. At the top of this hierarchy are the alpha male and alpha female. Animals can gain in rank by challenging more dominant individuals or by forming coalitions with other members in order to overthrow the higher ranking members. Being the alpha male comes with the benefit of having preferential access to resources and mating opportunities, whereas the subordinates are denied these privileges, or as the primatologist Siraj B. Dutta explains, monkeys often have clearly defined dominance relations with others in their social group. The dominant pair is regularly able to boss the subordinate, displacing it from food, drink, and other objects of competition or common attraction. This asymmetry in the relationship can be profoundly disadvantageous for the subordinate. Not only is its access to resources restricted, but it may experience physiological stress and may produce, raise, or even conceive fewer offspring. Although this paints a picture of alpha males as being tyrannical bullies, the reality is much more complicated, and dominant individuals who act mean and aggressively towards other group members are at great risk of losing their position, as McKenna explains. Gaining social support from group members, allies, due to an ingratiating personality or temperament can also permit an animal to rise in rank above a cranky, nasty counterpart who is strong but unable to solicit appropriate social support. Just like modern politicians, Dominant primates need to secure their position by forming alliances with others and by demonstrating their effectiveness as leaders. They do this by helping to resolve conflicts with the group 
and by providing a sense of security. One primatologist, Karen B. Stryer, explains the political life of primates in the following way. In primates with rigid hierarchies, like baboons or chimpanzees, a male's position in the pecking order and his access to mates can be partially dependent on his ability to maintain coalitionary support through mutual assistance and affiliative interactions with other males. Schreier goes on to write that, Males of some species also establish affiliations with one another by grooming, embracing, and providing reassuring contact. For this reason, subordinates often look up to the alpha male and admire him greatly, and effective alpha males are often very popular with the younger members of the group. This also increases social unity amongst group members, making the troop more resilient to external threats. One thing that is important to note for our purposes are the interactions between a dominant individual and a subordinate. Primates use a variety of communication signals to signify their place in the dominant's hierarchy. Dominant animals usually retain eye contact for longer than submissive animals, who will usually avert their gaze from dominant animals as a sign of appeasement. When confronted by dominant animals, subordinate primates need to change their behavior in order to prevent the dominant primate from becoming aggressive. McKenna discusses other behaviors which are used to signal submissiveness in relation to dominance. Dominance is attributed to individuals who evoke what is termed submissive or appeasement gesture, such as the presentation of hindquarters or vocalizing and grimacing in fear by the subordinate animal. In the presence of the alpha male, the subordinate needs to act in a submissive manner, putting on a sort of social mask in order to appease the alpha. The alpha male and females control over the group is what allows the group to stay together and not fight amongst each other. They essentially keep group members in check by monitoring their activities. However, the position of alpha is not stable, as each animal usually aspires to the position of alpha, leading to a high rate of turnover. Furthermore, as the population of the group increases, the group becomes more unstable and susceptible to fracturing and infighting, which is why group sizes rarely exceed a certain number. Part of the problem here seems to be that as group size increases, individuals do not have the time available to interact with all members of their group, or even to observe them interacting with individuals that they themselves interact regularly with. As group size increases, the alpha can't force every animal to be submissive because he can only interact with a few individuals at any given time. This allows subordinate males to engage in active behavior such as mating with females, and they can do this so long as they are not in the presence of the alpha male. The important thing to note about this is that the subordinates know when they are being watched by the alpha, so they know when or when not to engage in inappropriate behavior. Biologists have long pondered about the function of dominance. In general, one of the important functions of a group is protection from predators, as having more eyes in your band allows the group to more easily spot threats. Dominance may therefore be a way to conduct group affairs, such as foraging for food or searching for water. If each individual went about their business without considering the positions and activities of other group members, it may leave them vulnerable to predators. Hence, the social function of the dominant individual is to make decisions, mostly about the movements of the group, so that the group can remain as a cohesive unit. In gorillas, the group moves when the dominant male stands motionless with his legs spread and faces a certain direction. The other members of the group then crowd around him, and the troop moves off on its leisurely day's journey of about a third of a mile. So what does all of this have to do with the psychology of gods? The origin of gods is directly related to the fact that humans evolved the genes needed for abstract thinking, allowing them to consider and reflect upon things which aren't present in the immediate environment. This may sound trivial, but it really is a revolutionary development, and one that enabled the cognitive revolution. Another important precursor for the origin of gods is the origin of names, as Julian Jaynes writes. Now once a tribe member has a proper name, he can, in a sense, be recreated in his absence. He can be thought about, using thought here in a special non-conscious sense of fitting into language structures. This also roughly corresponds to the practice of burying the dead in ceremonial graves. The earliest gods were probably originally kings whose presence could be hallucinated even if the king wasn't present 
and even possibly after the king had died, as early temples were very often burial sites for deceased kings. By king, we are simply referring to the dominant individual amidst a band of humans. From these original kings, gods came to be imaginary or hallucinatory entities who were seated at the top of the dominance hierarchy. These entities existed in the collective imagination of the people they ruled. This can be seen if we examine some early civilizations. Believe it or not, the earliest city-states of Mesopotamia weren't ruled by people, but were ruled by hallucinatory gods, and the people were all subjects of the gods. These gods were often statues, located in temples, which were regularly visited by the people, and they really only existed in the minds of these people. The temples thus become the centers of social control, and the highest ranking members of the dominance hierarchy were supernatural entities believed to inhabit these temples and issue orders from them. People visited these temples to offer worship to the god, and look up to them in reverence in a similar way that alpha male primates are looked up to and revered. One possibility is that this hallucinatory presence originated from the right hemisphere, and in some sense can be thought of as taking the role of the dominant individual, controlling the more submissive left hemisphere in a system known as the bicameral mind. The bicameral mind is a form of social control, and it is that form of social control which allowed mankind to move from small hunter-gatherer groups to large agricultural communities. The bicameral mind with its controlling gods was evolved as a final stage in the evolution of language, and in this development lies the origin of civilization. I discuss all of this in a lot more detail in this video. We have discussed how primates need to behave submissively in the presence of the dominant individual, but can act less submissively if the dominant individual is absent. In the case of hallucinatory gods, the individual feels as if they are always present as auditory hallucinations. In other words, it feels as though these gods are always watching the person, and this causes the person's behavior to be more passive, so that their behavior is more easily controlled. From the person's perspective, the gods are always with them, telling them what to do, and it feels as though they are always being watched. Hallucinatory gods differ from alpha males in that their control over the group is relatively stable. Unlike high-ranking dominant individuals, gods can't simply be challenged and replaced. This is part of the reason why human groups are able to attain such a large size, as the splintering which occurs in other primates due to competition for the top position doesn't easily occur. The alpha male in a troop can die and be replaced, but the gods are immortalized in a sense, by temples, statues, and religious symbolism and so their rule over the people is relatively stable. From this position as hallucinatory presences, pacifying the behavior of the subjects, the gods can allow human groups to achieve huge sizes as compared to other primates. It seems that our ability to hallucinate and have imaginations about things which aren't tangible allowed human culture to become increasingly sophisticated, and it is one of the things which makes our species unique. It is important to note that these gods aren't simply authoritarian rulers over the people. The people worship the gods and revere them as sources of comfort and social unity, just like effective alpha males in primate societies. In this sense, gods are tapping into our primitive psychology in order to increase social control. In later societies, kings would return to rule the people in a form of government known as a theocracy. The gods were still technically the highest ranking entities, and the kings were their representatives on earth. Later in history, gods would go on to evolve significantly and take on different roles, such as personifying aspects of nature, standing for abstract concepts, or presiding over moral judgments. The significance of gods and religion in the cognitive development of our species can hardly be overstated. Gods aren't the only reason our species has been able to attain this level of intelligence, but they are an important factor in this development. The overwhelming importance of religion, both in general world history and in the history of the average world individual, is of course very clear from any objective standpoint, even though a scientific view of man often seems embarrassed at acknowledging this most obvious fact. For in spite of all that rationalist materialist science has implied since the scientific revolution, mankind as a whole has not, does not, and perhaps cannot relinquish his fascination with some human type of relationship to a greater and holy other. 
some mysterium tremendum, something necessarily indefinite and unclear, to be approached and felt in awe and wonder.